Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to our cosmic uh, conversation. Uh, this is the third one on this series that we're doing since uh, 2022 and now early 2023. Uh, my name is Andrea Araujo and I will be the host for today's conversation that is titled The Problem of Geosemiotics. I have with me today uh, two researchers and scholars on the field, uh, Bronislaw Szerzynski and Adam Wickberg. Uh, I will be the mediator uh, and they will both uh, talk a bit about their work, about the concept of geosemiotics and the, the research field around this legibility of the Earth. Uh, before we start, I just want to say that uh, this project, the Cosmic Conversations, is a series that started in 2020, and it's a project led by a research institution from Brazil, uh, APPH, it's the Research and Practice Associations on, Association on the Humanities, and it's led by a research group from this association called GEPEP, uh, the research group on ecology of practices. We also have uh, a partnership with the Anthropocene curriculum led by HKV in Germany. So we are happy to be exchanging with them. And their last uh, report published, uh, published late in 2022 has a lot to do with the matters we will be talking today. It is called the anthropogenic markers and I, I strongly recommend that you guys that are seeing this conversation check the, this report. There's a lot of texts, uh, uh, along with a text by Adam Wickberg, which is here with us. So there's a, uh, a lot of material on the idea of geosemiotics. Uh, if you guys there are um, seeing us right now, want to ask any questions, the chat on YouTube will be available for you to do it. So feel free if you want to ask something to Bron or to Adam to write here on our chat. And one last uh, announcement before we can start. Uh, this talk will be available, it's recorded and will be available on YouTube along with several others, uh, other conversations and lots of materials that you can find on our APPH uh, YouTube channel. So you can just uh, Google Cosmic Conversations on, or do it on YouTube and you will be able to find uh, lots of them, uh, both in Portuguese and in English. So uh, without further ado, I want to thank firstly Bron and Adam for being here today and to accept our invitation to to participate in this conversation and i would like would like to start our talk by asking you guys to introduce yourself and i want to uh, put the first question along with it and you can introduce yourselves and maybe talk a little bit uh, about how the idea of geosemiotics appear in both of your works and how this legibility or intelligibility of the earth can be understood in the terms of the Anthropocene. So I'm gonna uh, give the, 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 the word to you, Bron, and then Adam can do it too. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot for that great introduction, Andre. It was very useful. And yeah, thanks again for inviting me to be part of this fascinating uh, conversation. I'm sure it will be. Um, yeah, uh, so I am Professor of Sociology at Lancaster University in the United Kingdom. Uh, that my first degree was in the humanities um, and I've always had that humanities uh, component to what I do um, and I trained as a environmental sociologist you would say looking at environmental controversies environmental knowledge from a sociological point of view but in the last 10 years really really through engaging with the Anthropocene concept and geoengineering as well 
Um, and Hakave, particularly their work on the Anthropocene, and also the arrival of Nigel Clark, my uh, human geographer colleague at Lancaster about 10 years ago, has really pulled me into thinking about planetarity, you know, how the social, our social life and our human thought is conditioned by the fact we are beings that were produced by an evolving rocky planet <laughs> evolving around a, you know, a star, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm uh, thinking about, I mean, I don't know if I use the word geosemiotics <laughs> in any, any of my publications, but it's a very good, you know, um, uh, term to think through what I've been doing. And I, I suppose I would say, I mean, if I can, I, I'll try and be brief, but I can see three different levels of meaning in ge geosemiotics. And I think all of them relate to my work. I mean, the first is how the earth so this is of course using the idea of semiosis or semiotics as being the study of meaning and communication and how you know arrangements of matter and energy like sound and letters and and uh, images can can somehow convey meaning to some other you know subjectivity or whatever um so how does the earth carry meaning the earth and its components and its behaviors i mean so i say as i was saying there are three levels for me one is how it conveys meanings to humans you know so you know geology itself and geological science is about how to look at the signs of the earth you know all the different shapes that we can see on the surface of the earth and the different rocks and how we can use that to infer knowledge about the earth um, so th there's that kind of question and I can see Adam's work is really important in this in thinking about um, environing media the way our our own human understanding of the earth is mediated through digital technologies and satellites and uh, model computer models and things like that. But then there's this second level, which is um, what about other living things for whom the earth is meaningful? And that brings us into the kind of the sort of biosemiotic world, you know, inaugurated by people like Jakob von, von Uxkull and his idea of Umwelt and Milieu, this idea that each living thing perceives their environment it, through particular collections of signs, which might not overlap with the way we see the world at all. So in some sense, they inhabit different worlds, although they're inhabiting the same planet. And so, and I've done some thinking about how our bodies, as animal bodies, you know, um, of a certain size and, you know, with a our senses concentrated at the front and the top and subject to gravity and certain kind of balance of forces, you know, shape the way we experience the world and maybe the way we think about it. Um, but then thirdly, and I think this is where Nigel Clark and I have really tried to push thinking, is, is does the earth sense itself? You know, and so there's various people who've thought about does the earth in you know beyond living things also investigate itself in its evolution as it has explored over the last four and a half billion years the, the possibility space opened up to it after it had formed out of the protoplanetary disk you know and then evolved through all its stages and the Hadean and the Archean and everything um how how does it investigate itself and are there kind of roto signs in rocks and in in the air and in avalanches and in the movement of water and things like that. So that's another kind of level of very much more than human beyond the biological forms of geosemiosis, which are hard to think about, but I think are really exciting. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Adam, please. Yeah, thank you. And thanks again for, for inviting me and for having this great opportunity to be in conversation with Brian. It's, uh, Fantastic, really, and uh, I, I was um, well aware of, of your work, Ron, but it, I had the opportunity now to dive deeper into it, which I really appreciate. It's it's intriguing in many ways, and I think we can get back to that. But let me start with introducing myself, as I was asked to. Then I'm my name is Adam Wickberg. I'm a researcher at the ATH, uh, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, uh, at the Division of History of Science, Technology, and Environment. So basically, I'm a historian of 
technology, uh, science, technology, and environment, but I focus on media, digitalization, data, these aspects, mostly rec more recently on, on the 20th and 21st century, but I also did a lot of work on early modern colonial media history, uh, Spanish colonialism, and the mediation of, of nature and environments in that context. So I've been working through centuries, so to speak, but now I'm more focused on, on the, the, the history of the present or the recent history. And I'm also a visiting uh, scholar at the Max Planck Institute of History of Science in Berlin for two years. So I'm, I'm halfway into my second year here and uh, also uh, collaborating with the Anthropocene curriculum or Anthropocene Commons as it's now going to be inaugurated as uh, will be launched uh, next month as a, as a new decentralized network, which is great. And, and this, this project in, that you're doing in Brazil is of course also part of that. So I'm looking forward to different forms of collaborating with all of you around the question of the Anthropocene. And uh, my my background before, I mean, I'm a historian by training, cultural historian, but I also have a background in literature studies, literary studies, focusing on media. And that's, so to me, it was it's quite intriguing to come to this geosemiotics uh, concept. Uh, I don't also think that I've used it explicitly, but it's, it's implicit, I think, in my work. But in, in literature, literary studies, uh, semiotics is, ba is the basics of how you how you study uh, stories and so on. Uh, but then there was a turn to materiality and media, which I was a part of pushing. So I was trying to escape semiotics and go to, to the material. And now I can see how semiotics comes back with a vengeance from the earth itself in, in a very fascinating way. And I think it's it's time to take this to take the full circle and, and read the earth itself, like Braun has been doing for a while, much more than I have uh, in, a, in a more deep way. And I think this is, uh, is fantastic. And just, I mean, I have several things I could say about this, but just picking up on what you said now, Braun, I think this, this aspect that you have been working on non-human mediation and semiotics is really interesting. And I come to think about of course, genetic code, DNA, uh, uh, as, as the very basis of life, uh, information, uh, the, how, how the biosphere manages to replicate and evolve itself by what we at least call code information uh, that, that is somehow relates to, to, to se semiotics. Um, and then I would also just throw a question back to, to you, Bron, before maybe going into my own work uh, in, in um, in this uh, question of how does the earth sense itself. I, I was wondering how does that relates to, to the Gaia hypothesis and the work of James Lovelock, if you could expand something uh, uh, around that, the, the earth as a self-regulating entity and, and the, how it senses itself. Um, Thank you so much, Adam and Bron, uh, for the great introduction to the topic and to yourselves. Um, I'm, I'm, I want to uh, ask a question specifically now about the idea of semiotics regarding the Anthropocene, because one of the main scientific uh, debates right now regarding the Anthropocene is the idea of the golden spike, right? Or uh, the golden spike being the moment in which we can say for certain or uh, from a ge uh, geological, geological perspective, the moment that human intervention can be found in geological strata. But this seems to pose uh, a, a, a question regarding scientific semiotics or the uh, semiotics of geology more specifically, and the way which we can identify a sign on the earth and its relation to a scientific fact. How can we read the signs on the earth? And how do you see this, this discussion right now, the scientific properly uh, or geologic, uh, geologically uh, properly discussion uh, in relation to a semiotics uh, problem in general? Or how can semiotics help or problematize the, this research, the scientific research on this regard to the Anthropocene? Can be Bron or Adam. Feel free to to start, Bron. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll start again if that's okay with you, Adam. And yeah, yeah sure. I mean, I've made notes of those a couple of you know things that I think we can return to later if we talk about elemental media. We can bring in sure. that to the question there, maybe. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So the the gold. So the golden spike. 
So this is the idea, uh, these are sometimes technically known as these GSSEs, I think it is, Global Stratosphere, oh, I can't remember what it stands for, <laughs> Stratotype, I can't remember, GSSP, technically. This is the idea of taking a particular rock section in the earth, or it could be a layer of ice or, or in a lake, some deposits of in a lake, you know, where you can see a sign uh, a, a kind of um, stratigraphic sign that something changed in the earth, you know, where suddenly you get plastic or uh, radionuclides or something like that. And so trying to find a place on the earth which um, which can stand as a sort of metonymy, to use a sort of semiotic, you know, term, um, to stand in for the whole, you know, the, the change in the earth system that the Anthropocene is supposed to be naming. And uh, yeah, and it's really, it's really fascinating question. And um, so I did, with Bruno Latour, uh, we put on an exhibition in 2014 in, in Toulouse called the Anthropocene Monument, where we invited, uh, I think it was 22 in the end artists to devise a monument to the Anthropocene. And, and that was partly, for me, that was, that was partly uh, because I was fascinated by um, other GSSPs that there are, you know, all around, dotted around the earth. A lot of them are in China, uh, because there's some great rock sections in quarries in China and things like that, where, you know, there are these literally these golden or, you know, metal bronze or whatever they are spikes hammered into the rock. And it's the global reference point. And it did make me think, and I published this paper called the Anthropocene Monument uh, uh, after that exhibition. It did make me think that actually geology has already has a sort of what I call a monumental semiotic. You know, so when you approach one of these GSSPs, you know, often there's a there's another sort of human made monument nearby which somehow commemorates the designation by a committee a subcommittee of the you know the stratigraphic commission uh, on a particular date in human history you know to designate this point on the earth's surface as somehow standing in for a point in earth time that might have been you know a billion years ago like you know half a billion years ago the the bottom of the cambrian e e period you know um and so, you know, there's a lot you can see how, and if you look at the history of, ge of modern geology as it kind of co comes together in the 19th century, you know, they borrowed lots of uh, ways of knowing from antiquarianism, you know, where you dig up little um, artifacts made by human beings in the past, and then out of those you build a story of, of, you know, you build together a, a story of history. And so cohering the earth as a historical object, an object which has evolved over time, not just biological evolution, but also geological ev evolution, depended on borrowing from uh, these, the human sciences, you know, so the earth sciences uh, took their, initially took their ways of knowing of the earth, you know, for, as they dug up fossils and things like that, you know, and they, you, you know, and, you know, people like, um, von Humboldt and, uh, and and so on, some of these early pioneers, they, they you know, use this language of monuments or denkmal, you know, to describe what they were digging up. And so they, uh, so I, I think already geology has these, se these semiotics. Uh, okay, I mean, I, I should pass over to Adam, but I'll just leave on one thought, which is, you know, a lot of the work of our social scientists around the Anthropocene is saying, oh, we need to politicise this, you know, that it's not just a scientific judgment where we place, where we say the Anthropocene started, whether it was with the, you know, the European colonization of America or the atom bomb or the industrial revolution, you know, these all have political implications. And I think this is really true. Um, but, but I think, um, you know, there are other more interesting questions we can perhaps we can get into as well, not just, uh, not just about, um, uh, about bringing in, you know, the sort of usual things that social scientists say that, you know, we need to think socially and politically. But I'll, I'll, I'll pass over to Adam at this point. Thank you, Bron. Uh, and yeah, I think this uh, interesting question, and uh, I think uh, you mentioned, Andre, my essay in that, that uh, dossier that the Anthropocene curriculum did on strategic graphic markers, and I, I called it 
anthropogenic markers as environing media. And I tried to take a stab at how this very process of naming and dating uh, itself is part of, uh, well, I don't want to get too technical uh, or theoretical here, but what I and my colleagues in this approach to environing media call the feedback loop between know knowing and doing the environment that you, you mediate uh, the environment, the global environment, you extract the information and then you act upon this information which then comes to act the observe uh, change the observed object and in this feedback loop between know knowing and doing which by the way geoengineering is also a very good example of but if we stick with this gssp question of course i've had, had uh, plenty of time and occasions to think about and discuss this because i worked on early modern colonial history spanish history uh, the colombian exchange which is basically the basis for what uh, Lewis and Maislin proposed as an Orbis hypothesis to, to start the, the Anthropocene at 1611 uh, with this decline in, in uh, carbon dioxide uh, due to massive uh, deforestation due to mass, uh, mass death of the indigenous people, the 65 million people who were living there who disappeared over uh, the course of a century. And this is very compelling, uh, but it's based uh, apart from this um, uh, glacier uh, dome ice core, which shows this decline in, in carbon dioxide with about 10 ppm. So it's not dramatic, but there is a decline, it's visible. Uh, but the rest of, of the case is built on historical material, which to me as a historian is very you know compelling. Uh, but then the more I thought about this and the more I uh, had, had a chance to interact with and work with the people of AWG in this context, uh, I've see, I see that from a geological point of view and from an earth system point of view too, this might not be the most solid evidence to start the Anthropocene, but rather as they propose and are proposing now uh, in a few months uh, time uh, officially to start it with the bomb spike in 1915, the radionuclides uh, fallout. Uh, but that doesn't take away any of this deeper historical context, quite the contrary. And now I'm going to do the opposite of what, what Bron was saying that and say that we do need to, to politicize uh, the, the Anthropocene. And that's a task for historians, for humanists, for so, uh, social scientists, but also for, for uh, Earth system scientists to think politically ab about this thing and not to stop at, at the dating. And I think that even with a start date in 1950, there must be a historical explanation of the different forces that led up to this, this situation. So that's about this, the debates, and I won't get deeper into it because, as you know, there are many papers you can read in the Anthropocene Review and, and elsewhere if you want to get into the discussions and the details about them. But but it's more interesting, I think, uh, as Bron is suggesting, to move on to, to ask questions about remembering uh, or mon monumentality of starting uh, an epoch. And then, uh, of course, to me, again, as a, as a historian, the, the implications of a new epoch starting in 1950 means that we basically need to rewrite all of modern history. Everything that we thought of as progress, development, the, the, the courses that we put the different parts of the world on in the name on the, of the in the post-war era on the name of peace and prosperity now has proves uh, wrong or, or problematic at least. So we need to rewrite this whole process. What were the forces that led us to where we are now? And that's a huge task uh, that need, need all of us to work together. But yeah, I'm going to stop at that. And I saw Bron want to say something, I think. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, just picking up on what you're saying, really, and uh, I'm not arguing against the politicization of these monuments at all, but, you know, GSSPs and, and these dating things, but just sort of trying to go beyond this simple opposition, I suppose. But but yeah, I mean, so I suppose when I was working on this exhibition uh, with Latour and thinking a lot about how monuments work, I mean, in, in a you know, human semiotic thing, as you, you know, the whole idea of the kind of traditional monument is it's got a certain sort of size and durability and ancientness. And so when you walk up to a rock section, even if it's just a, even if it's not a GSSP and you see, you know, like you go to the Jurassic coast, you know, on the South of England and you go, you're going back, you know, millions of years, that sense of, of connectedness, from your time, not human time, you know, you can you go there at a particular hour, on a particular day, and a particular year of your life with your family or whatever, you know, the human time, and then you're connecting to this inhuman time of where there were no humans at all, you know, for example, you know, so monuments have always done that work of connecting 
you know, the human time and inhuman time, but also of this place and greater forces, you know, the global and historical issues. And, and, and so I think, you know, wherever the GSSP is placed, you know, whether it's an ice core or a lake deposit or, or a quarry or whatever, you know, we have to think about what will the body human bodies feel like as they approach it and that's it's and it's partly it's partly yes about the scientific issues but it's and it's but it's partly about what meanings that carries as you as as you approach it and and i suppose one of the things i think is that geology has you know all the other gssps are like at least you know twelve thousand years in the past or you know a million years or a billion years in the past and with the Anthropocene, we're talking about a very different kind of way of thinking about time—a time which is already unfolding. And and it's and there's this like like you say this feedback loop between the way we, in this case, the way we think about the Anthropocene, and then what the Anthropocene becomes. Hmm. You know, we you know like Aristotle was it you know is quoted as saying something like you know never judge a man's or a human's life until it's over. You know whether they were happy or not. And we can we don't know what the Anthropocene is till it's over, but it's already underway. And the way we conceive of it, and the way we mark it, and commemorate it, and mourn it, or celebrate it, whatever we do, will shape what it is. And so that that may, means that this GSSP, wherever it is placed, won't be all about the timeless, settled past. It'll also be about the future and what we do. So in a way, it's a breaking with breaking into a whole new way of thinking about how we mark the earth time, I think. Adam? Yeah, no, I just want to want to say that that's, a, that's a, such an excellent point that you bring up, Ron, and, a, and a, such an important and, and, and interesting thing to think more about. And I think that it's needed. It's, it's not present enough in these discussions that we don't just have to think about the past or where to start it, but where it takes us the future. And if you go with uh, Jan Asman's concept of cultural memory, it takes a couple of generations for this to start. And then you, if you think a couple of generations into the future, then you have to consider this process that we are in the middle of now, uh, of, of the Anthropocene, of the starting of it, the early days of the Anthropocene, and how it will be remembered, how it will be commemorated or mourned uh, and understood. And this is something that um, urgently needed both in the scholarly debate and I think in the public debate, it should be much more present. So I just want to add that. Um, Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, we could, uh, we, we will be able to talk more about the scientific uh, dimension of uh, the research for the Golden Spike and also what story is this Golden Spike when its consensus uh, will be able to tell, right? Uh, what, they, what, what they tell about our past and what they, they uh, make us do in terms of practices uh, in terms of the future. But I wanted to introduce another uh, concept here in our discussion that uh, Bron already mentioned a bit, and I add them uh, too. That's a, a concept that has been, uh, was, was uh, uh, I don't know, first coined maybe by the media scholar John Durham Peters, uh, the idea of the elemental media, talking about how uh, different sorts of mediation, the earth being one of them, as we were uh, discussing, uh, can produce and, and, and generate what we could call in a, in a broad sense, meaning. Uh, how do you guys understand these sorts of readings and meaning-making practices that can be understood as other than human, more than human, non-human? Can we understand uh, in this idea of the Anthropocene, the Earth as some sort of media. And, and if we can, how can we uh, understand this, this uh, age-old and historical perspective that, that separated techniques and nature, and how they converge and diverge in this idea of the elemental media? Adam, can you start? Okay. Sure, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is a good, uh, good and intriguing question, and and happy to bring in elemental media to, to the table uh, here. I think it's a it's a great concept in many ways. I had the uh, opportunity to 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 write an article with John Durham Peters, who so had the chance to think about it then. But also when we did this environmental media 
book and started to develop that. I won't get into too much detail about it, but of course we got the question that, okay, so what's the difference here between environing media and elemental media? So we had to try to unpack that and think about it. And I, what we came up with is that it's complementary, that elemental media is a more uh, a broader and, and more basic concept in a way. Uh, and it's also a way of overcoming this, this separation between nature and culture that, that in a sense, uh, media were always elemental and uh, media are built out of elements and, and uh, our interactions with the with, uh, water bodies or, or earth bodies and so on can be understood as elemental media and different scholars have picked up this. Uh, Nikol Staroselsky has also done, done a lot of great work on, on elemental media and very imaginative ways of, of understanding that, that goes goes pretty far. But but to me, again, in, in this in this context, I think that my focus has been on, on the environing part, which is this, uh, on the one hand, uh, gathering uh, data, processing data, and so on about the world, about the global environment, uh, and then which produces knowledge and leads to epistemologies, environmental epistemologies, that then in turn uh, leads us to act upon this knowledge about the object that we were observing, as, as I was saying. And there is, there's a huge discussion debate over the past five to ten years in media studies uh, or the focus on media environment where, where I've been working that were different people have different approaches Jennifer Gabriel has a very interesting approach that builds on on whitehead and have that mediation do not really uh, or, or rather the objects of, of nature and and culture do not prefigure pre-exist the act of mediation so when we wire a tree uh, to a sensor network, then we come to experience that nature, but there's no nothing before this, these connections are, are being made. So it's very rela relational in that sense. And and for 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 Yonder and Peters, it's been more a focus of, on how human ingenuity come to mold or shape the elemental, or take out something that is already media in nature that was always there, but, but we had to uh, acquire a certain technical ability to, to, to make it visible or to make use of it. And all of this, again, is very central, I think, to, to the Anthropocene, to understanding the Anthropocene and, and dating and, and uh, you know, uh, the, as geologists do, as we have been discussing, but also to understand the very, uh, the process of, of Anthropocene particularly in the Great Acceleration, uh, those graphs, you know, that look like hockey stick curves that have an increase of human impact and, and, and that you can see in the earth system trends and, and social or human, human trends like population growth and, and so on and so forth. So that leads me at least to ask how are these connected? What is, what is the connector between how humans do this impact and you see the impact? And I think that, that uh, media or elemental media is a good candidate to, to respond to that question. I don't want to go on too long, so I leave it over to Bron, and maybe we can ping pong or we move on. We'll see. Perfect, Bron. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just just um, looping back through the great acceleration graphs. I mean, yeah, I don't. Uh, it's interesting to think about how you know, and you're thinking much more about that feedback loop of of how we know the Earth shapes how what what we do with the Earth, and it's interesting. I mean. With my work with Andrew Jarvis at Lancaster, we're focusing much more on the energy graphs and, and energy technologies and the way, um, you know, particularly his work has been about how um, the resource and acquisition networks through which we obtain energy resources, you know, seem to be following a sort of uh, their own kind of inhuman logic, you know, above and beyond any hu human decisions, you know, if you look at the sort of energy curves over the last 150 years and, and you know, thinking that through what that means philosophically about our situation is interesting and it, uh, is, is really important, I think, and I've been trying to do that work with him. Uh, but, you know, what, what you're reminding me is that the media, the, the, the information gathering technologies has to be part of that picture as well. But just going back to uh, elemental media, and I think um, in one of the ways I got, got into thinking about and uh, discovering Peter's work before I discovered yours, Adam, uh, you know, um, uh, John Durham Peter's work, uh, is uh, I started work working a bit, interacting a bit with the artist Thomas Saracino, who's Berlin-based, and uh, 
were, some of his work is with solar balloons, these balloons which are worn by the sun and lift into the air um, and float off and, you know, often across, uh, um, across national borders and have to be retrieved from the forest of Poland or whatever. Um, but really using the, and working with Sasha Engelman as well, uh, uh, another geographer, uh, collaborator with Tomas, um, trying to think what do these balloons tell us about the earth, you know, thinking through the balloon as a sort of, a, mm. a, 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 you know, like, a, a, again, a sort of metonym to think through the earth. And so I thought a lot about um, the way that things drift, you know, like the way dust drifts from the Sahara to the Amazon and the way um, sediment moves down rivers. As, you know, there's all these kind of processes where uh, bodies are drifting within media. So the media are, drift, are moving and flowing around, you know, the winds of the atmosphere and the storms and everything, or the, you know, the flows of the hydrosphere. But within those flows, there are also these bodies, these solid bodies that have, um, that follow their own course. And, you know, the way that rivers can sort sediment and, you know, uh, theorists like Manuel de Landa, who I mentioned before, I think, um, he sees like, river processes as kind of like proto computation you know mm -hmm. where um you know there's a calculation of forces you know force you know uh, which which sort out sediment as to as to which will drift along the top of the river which will go along the middle and which will be deposited as you know and form these you know pebble um uh, beds along the bottom and you know producing all the rocks and all the complexity of the earth you know even ores you know met metallic ores are all produced by hydrological processes processes of drift where where things are different minerals and chemical you know chemical uh, atomic types are uh elements in that sense are differentially um lifted, deposited, dissolved, you know, uh, uh, sedimented out, etc. Um, so to me, that started me thinking about the way, you know, like uh, the, the water or the air is a medium, you know, in, in both senses, you know, that, that as sediment moves along, you know, it's, the interaction between particles is mediated by the water or the air or whatever it is between them. So I think this is where I start to think, you know, I am thinking geosemiotically, I think, you know, where I, I'm sort of thinking how there's elements of what we think of as full-blooded, meaningful communication and thought and computation and cognition there are sort of little fragments of it that emerge out of the very nature of a of a of a planetary body like the earth that has all these different chemical types and these and solids and fluids and is held out of equilibrium by the flows of energy from the sun and from its hot core and everything so that there's all these opportunities that the earth has to you know um to uh, even if fleetingly, you know, exhibit these sort of really these properties, which just are edging into what we would call semiosis, and include. But part of that is this sort of withdrawing of, of, uh, 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 or separation between something and the medium that surrounds it, and then a kind of a division of labour that happens between the body and the media and the medium around it, and the way that mediates relations between bodies. So. Uh, that's the sort of way I've got into thinking about sort of, you know, in the non-biological world, how the sort of proto-semiotic processes occur in the air. Um, you want to jump in again, Adam? I don't know. Yeah, sure. Feel free, I, I can, feel free yeah, to, no, I, to I, do I'd it. I'd be happy to, to continue to stick with this point yeah. for a little bit. I mean, it's very interesting all of what, what you say, Bron, and it resonates with a lot of my own thinking here and I, in this book we did on environment media and edited collection we had a piece by Eva Horn uh, on the air as medium and uh, she had uh, several examples there was a second essay she wrote on that uh, but which also talks about pathologies of the air and one of her more striking or like she started the essay out with that example of, of the coronavirus and of course the air mediates pathogens we, we we were made aware of that before the pandemic most people didn't think much about it but all of a sudden we had data and visualizations of how close to each other we could stand and how 
virus moves through the air, but this is ongoing everywhere and all the time. And that, that was a, a case in point for me that how before we have the techniques of visualization, the media, we could not see this. But, but as you say, it's also the fact that the air itself is an elemental medium that mediates pathogens long before we could see it. So it's not that I'm taking a, a Kantian correlation stance to say that if we cannot see it, this doesn't exist. Of course it does, but, but the way we see it and the way we come to see it matters for how we understand it and has implications, basically. But, but if this is a good time, I'd also like to, to come back to that initial question because I'm curious about Bron's thinking about the Gaia hypo hypothesis and the relation to how the Earth senses itself and the Earth as a self-regulating entity in relation maybe to elemental media, the, the whole Earth as an elemental medium. Uh, what do you think, Bron? Uh, well, um, uh, gosh, yeah, I mean, I have been thinking quite a bit about Gaia not least since I attend, I was very fortunate to attend the um, conference organized by the University of Exeter a few years ago on the occasion of James Lovelock's 100th birthday, it was which was you know a few days before, I think, organized by Tim Lenton and others at Exeter. And it was an amazing, uh, amazing event. Um, you know, I was one evening we we had an open mic in a pub and I sang a song with a ukulele and recited a poem about a speck of cosmic dust and Latour, Bruno Latour um acted out part of one of his uh sort of theatrical guy and dramas it was just amazing and and there i also met um met up with uh a few people who we then convened a little online group that kept us thinking about guy through covid and that was uh bruce clark uh who's written quite a few books you know has a literary background but he's very much a gaia theorist and and um historian of gaia theory um, with Sebastian Le Ditchbury, uh, and also a couple of Earth scientists, um, Michelle Crucifix and Sergio Rubin. So my thinking on Gaia has been very much informed by their approach of, of those three, which itself is informed by a kind of second order cybernetics um, approach. Um, so, you know, that's this, what I mean by that is the sort of for example, um, Maturana and Varela, their this sort of theoretical bio biology, which tries to think about what living things are, not just in terms of um, their the obvious empirical uh, features that living things have on the earth, like you know metabolism and reproduction and movement and and uh, things like that but something that's more fundamental about the way that living things endure, the way they have this really odd causal structure that they seem to insulate themselves from being purely uh, determined by their environment, to somehow liberate themselves from the environment causally. And often people like uh, Robert Rosen draw on Aristotelian ideas of final causation and formal cause, cause and things like that. So I, I've been very influenced by that. And I, I do think, um, although, yeah, I mean, that there is semi semiotic thinking going in there, uh, definitely. Um, it's a slightly different world. You know, it, there's overlap, I think, between that neo-cybernetic or second-order cybernetic approach um, and the more biosemiotic approach, which I, you know, relate to people like Jesper Hoffmeier and uh, people like that. Um, so, gosh, I mean, I'm not sure I can land this intervention very, very clearly, but because um, a, a lot of the, that work is about different kinds of causation, you know, that's the way it thinks, you know, and the sort of mapping of of the way that living things and maybe the whole biosphere is one of these that somehow insulates itself in some sense from its external environment you know it it starts to make its own luck and and you know so that the habitability of the earth is not purely at the mercy of the strength of the sunlight coming in it somehow can modulate itself which is part of the Gaia hypothesis you know that's that's normally described in this sort of area in terms of different kinds of causation you know efficient cause and material cause and final cause um i think it can be related to the idea of semiosis and meaning but uh 
I think I need to think a little bit more about it. Uh, but anyway, that's the sort of thing I'm thinking. I'm sure it's absolutely important, importantly related. But I suppose what I'm saying is my most my thinking about this has been using this language of different kinds of causation and, and also reflexivity, the way causes loop round and determine themselves rather than uh, semiosis per se. Because there's a, a, a historical relation possible to be made here on the semiotics field and systems theory field. They, they, they uh, intersect at some point, and I don't think that the, some, some of the systems theory, like the Gaia hypothesis, um, uh, take in consideration some of the system si si um, systemic semiotics uh, work that were made. So this idea of the 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 this this uh, reflective reflexive uh, loop of the Earth itself can be thought of in semiotic terms, I guess, uh, no no doubt. And and the, the the theoretical tools kind of exist, I guess. But it, it's one of those 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 matters of some approaches from the 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 history of sciences and how they they branch and they kind of go parallel uh when they could be a bit more crossed in some some senses yeah, Adam, do, do, yeah. do you wanna do you wanna jump in or we can change the subject a bit yeah no i think we can we can move on if you want okay just, uh, add, add this um historical uh observation that that uh, the birth of the the guy hypothesis uh, james lovelock in the in the 60s and his work coincides with with the, of course the birth of cybernetics and, and computer and computation so you're developing technical systems to observe biological systems and there is an interesting still not fully understood i think overlap that, I, that needs to be explored more fully that i am also keen on exploring at some point well we, we could um jump a question and, and continue on this idea of computation and di di uh, digitization uh, because there's this, uh, Adam talks about it and some other uh, uh, people talks, uh, talk about it, this idea of this kind of um, paradox, uh, a scientific and technological paradox regarding the Anthropocene and how we can uh, create uh, the, the visibility of the Anthropocene. On the one hand, uh, we can only gather enough scientific da data and uh, enough uh, 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 factual uh, evidences about the effects of the Anthropocene uh, if we have, as Adam was saying, this planetary scale uh, that data, um, data technology together and compute this data to, to get like this, uh, the whole earth sciences and, 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 and atmospheric chemistry it needs a whole infrastructure, a technical infrastructure that could be even said it's some sort of uh, geoengineering project, a scientific one to, to understand how the Earth functions. On the other hand, uh, we know that the same infrastructure is responsible in some matter on the effects or the, uh, the, the worst effects or the nocive effects of the human intervention on uh, the need for more energy, the, the liberation of carbon in the atmosphere, is made also by the techno -scientific, uh, te technical scientific uh, complex that give us the evidence of human intervention. It's kind of this, this paradox that we only know about the Anthropocene by producing the, more of the effects of the Anthropocene. How do you guys uh, see this paradox, this idea of uh, a, pro a geoengineering project that creates the conditions to we can even uh, create the conditions to even say that there is an, an Anthropocene, and how can we solve this paradox? Can you talk a little bit about that? Feel free to start, each one of you. Do to get first, Adam? Yeah, okay, I can go first, sure. Um, yeah, the, the paradox of the technosphere, as I called it uh, uh, somewhere, uh, and the technosphere, of course, being this concept launched by Peter Huff a few years ago, a geologist, that is the sum of all techno 
technological parts on Earth, which uh, now outweighs the, the biomass. Uh, and uh, one of the more uh, challenged uh, parts of the, the idea of the technosphere that we could also discuss is uh, the, the, the notion of agency or how agency works in the technosphere, because for half, uh, humans cannot really affect the technosphere and the technosphere can't really affect humans. So there's like, there's no traffic because the, the technosphere is a, a self-regulating system. Even if humans are building its parts, it is now driving itself. It, it cannot be uh, changed at will, so to speak. But then there are others like Jürgen Renn uh, who have different ideas about, about that aspect, but, but maybe we can come back to that. Uh, but but the, the very the paradoxical or the, the tension between um, observing uh, global environmental problems and that the very technologies that allows us to observe them are often uh, developed and driven by the problems that we are causing or we are seeing the problems while we are creating them, so to speak. And this is, um, I mean, a lot of the early computer technology came out of military interest as did a lot of earth system observation also has, has this history of of military funding and geopolitical interest and then of course there's uh, corporate and commercial funding because there's always a need for something the technical innovation comes from and this has the tendency to 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 lead so far at least to this to, to play into the great acceleration uh, the way the way we see it now this doesn't have to be the case. I mean, the technology is what, what we, we use it for. It doesn't have to be used that way, but the way that that human population dynamics has worked so far, it ha has been the case. So it's hard to, to escape this. And that usually there's a, I mean, this anyone working in conservation will know this, that there's a, a strong lag between knowledge and action. So that once we have observed a problem in the oceans, for instance, there's a, a long, um, 5, 10, 20 year wait until we have some effective measures like a, a conservation or a, a park to protect this area. Whereas the effects of the, the human impacts coming from something else like overfishing uh, is already over when we have observed it and we've, when we have acted upon it. So that's a problem. Then of course, bringing in geoengineering, uh, solar radiation management as, as proposals to, to kind of fix this, that to add an extra technological layer to, to stop uh, the, the sun, the radiative forcing to warm up the planet and so on. But then again, that doesn't take away the, in that example, doesn't take away the, the carbon dioxide for, from the atmosphere. It just stays there and doesn't take away the ocean acidification and so on. So there's, and there's currently a lot of, I see both in geoengineering discussions as they are now moving, I think, closer to, to policy options and political actors being being willing to to talk more openly about it than has been the case but also in in broadly in, in the, the the turn to digitalization more broadly and automation that there's this hope to solve problems and everyone is very keen on having a solution to a very difficult problem and they don't want to know about the the, the, the potential negative side effects that will come from this um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I could stop at that. We could go on. There are different, different aspects to this, and we have different uh, thoughts about it. But I, I want to hand it over to Bron, just to not keep talking myself, to go back and forth. I think it's better. Perfect. Bron? Yeah, that's a fascinating question and, and uh, response to it from, from Adam. Um, yeah, I mean, so I heard someone use... Is, did Einstein? There's so many quotes that were have been attributed by Albert Einstein in the age of memes. It's hard to know which to remember which one was he really said. But uh, he was quoted the other day in something I saw saying, you, "You can't solve a problem with the same thinking that produced it," or something like that. And it's a nice thought, whoever said it. Um, I think it's sometimes true. It's sometimes not true. I think you know certain processes can be self regulating and that goes back to you know first order cybernetics you know the thermostat sort of you know feedback loop that kind of you know and um i know some work some interesting astrobiological work done by adam frank with various authors over the last few years has been looking at whether you know there might be a general pattern in technological civilizations wherever they arise in the universe that maybe at least some of them might you know find a way of becoming 
having a biosphere and a technosphere together on a planet which becomes self-regulating you know so that it becomes a benign feedback loop uh between knowing and doing um uh, living on a planet um so that they don't destroy themselves like we seem to be doing um but yeah and I, i'm glad that adam mentioned the work of peter half who has been a huge influence on me meet i met him mainly through the hakave uh, project in berlin um i made sure i uh, sat next to him on the minibus going from the hotel to the to the auditorium every day because I just so enjoyed our conversations and uh, I mean, one thing that I really liked about his work is it resonated with the sense that Nigel Clark and I have that you know one of our mantras is the human you know what is it to be human always opens out into the inhuman you know what is essentially human you know what is the essence of being human you as soon as you the, the deeper you look into it opens out into inhuman things whether it's opening out into technology or whether it's opening out into um the powers of the earth like you know of fire and water and and uh combustion and motion and everything that we you know combine our, ourselves with you know so and i think half's work really you know from that kind of physical geography uh, angle he comes at the same point you know the idea that yeah we need to rethink what it is to be human and you know our, our ability to influence things because there are these other forces that are going on that are out of our control and i think that's really interesting i mean something else that nigel clark sometimes says is that um maybe you know so maybe capitalism is a mistake that the planet made and you know maybe uh, maybe when planets get a bit old like ours is you know halfway through its probable life before this is swallowed up by the red you know the, the sun expanding um maybe it starts doing things which have these runaway effects you know like call it capitalism call it the technosphere or whatever so those are all um poss possible things you know so i suppose what i'm saying is it's too early to say it might be that our technosphere is developing you know negative uh, feedback loops which will regulate itself in a way that Adam Frank hopes or is suggesting happens you know that we learn to to know the you know what we're doing in a way which will enable us to sort of close the material loops and and become much more sustainable uh, or it may be it might it might be not you know and obviously you know we, we can only do as much as we, you know we should all endeavor to do as much as we can however much agency humans have to try to to um produce a good outcome rather than rather than a bad one um uh yeah i think i'll stop there thank you if you want to jump in adam feel free please oh you're mute you're you're yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah. yeah thanks yeah, we could. Uh, I, I could go on with this uh, discussions for 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 longer. It's uh, to me. I mean, this is a really interesting point, and and particularly this. Uh, I mean, the, you're uh, you bring up uh, Adam Frank, who has this hope, uh, Bron, but also James Lovelock in his last book, The Nova Scene, had this idea about that uh, the the coming age of hyperintelligence would would somehow regulate, and, and maybe that's a, a vain hope. Um, at the, at the look of things right now but but you have to take a maybe we also need to be open to take a longer view on things than we, the immediate political context we are in at the moment i think that shifting between these temporal scales is, is important and is a task for for all of us who are engaging in the in, in the research on the anthropocene need to grapple with it and then uh, coming to that i mean geoengineering we, we brought that up now uh, is, is uh, becoming more and more uh, plausible the more we go on without uh, cutting emissions. Um, there will be a point probably in a 10 or 20 year time frame without a radical change where this will be more or less unavoidable. Uh, the, the window is closing as, as many scientists are proposing. Then uh, 
there needs to be an engagement uh, to think about what kind of common planetary future we want. Is, is it a high tech solution or is, a, is it a degrowth of Earth socialism as others are proposing? I'm not advocating for either. I'm just saying that these forces are, are working and we need to take both a closer look and the, and the longer, longer one to understand them properly, I think. Um, but yeah. Um, is it, you're bringing up this uh, political, uh, more mainly political issues. I wanted to bring up something that is happening here in Brazil, uh, which has uh, it has like this abstract connection to the the discussions we're having here, but also it's a very pressing and real uh, political problem that we are facing uh, or we were ignoring and now starting to face more frontally here in Brazil. Uh, I don't know if you heard about it uh, recently. Uh, there was a report here in Brazil that uh, regarding illegal practices of, miner uh, of extractivism and mineration, especially in the Amazon. And the report found out that most of the minerals that were being extracted from uh, the Amazon were being illegally uh, smuggled to uh, Europe and then sold to big tech companies such as Apple, uh, Amazon, uh, Google, in order to produce media technologies like cell phones, computers and stuff. And uh, things that were being mined here uh, go, uh, uh, well, rare earth in, in general. Uh, th there's this uh, this problem in contemporary media culture that is being brought up, as you guys already mentioned, the, the this this realization of this mineral substrate of media technologies and the practices that 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 support it. You know, like our phones are in a, a certain sense, or our computers uh, directly connected to illegal practice of practices of uh, mining. And in the case of Brazil, uh, it, it comes along with uh, murder, ethnocide, and lots of uh, uh, this, this violence against indigenous uh, people in the Amazon. Th th this is something that it, it, uh, the report came out in the uh, late uh, 2022, but it was uh, very impactful for us living here in Brazil. But it, it, it relates in a certain sense, I guess, with something that Braun has been writing about for some time, these geo-spiritual spiritual formations. Uh, because not only we are uh, uh, producing this, this giant violence against indigenous people, but we are also turning some geological formations that have a spiritual meaning into cell phones, that have different meanings. So you have like this, in a, in a certain sense, uh, 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 physical violence, but also uh, semi semiotic violence and uh, spiritual violence that we are uh, creating an homogeneous way of understanding meaning um, through media culture to social media that are, are, are the, the main ways in which we, we create meaning uh, uh, collectively and just trying these different ways of creating meaning. So I know it's a broad uh, question, but I would, <laughs> would really want to know how do you guys feel about that, this idea of the mineral substrate and the, the, the connections that are made between these mineral uh, 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 practices and these geo-spiritual formations. Brown, if you could start, because I, I would really want to hear you on that. Thanks. I mean, that's uh, well, well, a huge and interesting and important uh, question. And I'm glad it also, I was starting to think we needed to edge into um, opening up the conversation to sort of non-Western forms of knowing as well, because so far we've been very much focusing on, you know, both the sort of science and also social science developed in uh, modern Western societies. And, you know, like, if we're really going to do planetary social thought, as you know, Nigel and I called our last book, you know, we, we need we need to be, you know, to provincialize, you know, Western thinking a little bit and op open things up. And yeah, this is a good way of doing it. I mean, um, and it's a, it's a it's a horrible and fascinating example. I mean, 
There's an example we use in, uh, Nigel and I use in the book, which Nigel kind of led on writing this chapter. I think it's might be chapter five, where it's uh, a, a case from his own part of the world. You know, he was born in uh, Australia. And as uh, the example he uses is um, aerial top dressing of mineral guano um, used in New Zealand and Australia to convert um, the land there into something like European farmland by Euro the European settlers. And the way that that, um, that rock was sourced on these um, Pacific islands, um, the inhabitants of which regarded the land as part of themselves. So they see that it's like they're as if their ancestors are being mined and um, mobilized and uh, monetized and put onto planes and spread on the land and turned into crops to grow more, you know, white Australian bodies or whatever, you know. So, um, but this is a, another really good, really good and, you know, disturbing example, you know, of these um, rare earths, I presume you're talking about. I'm not an expert on this, you know, which are, you know, in all our devices, like the ones we're talking on now, and are sourced from parts of the world, often with, you know, uh, uh, indigenous peoples and, uh, you know, something less than full um, social and economic and political rights and, and so on. I think this is a really good, uh, good example, especially because of the way these become media, you know, which plays into Adam's uh, world. Uh, um, but it's also, yeah, what you say about, you know, the destruction in the, the version of the que this question that you sent us in advance, you know, about also the destruction of these um, of these uh, um, non-Western, you know, societies and worldviews and ways of, ways of living and ways of seeing the world. And that is important. Uh, and something that Nigel and I think about quite a bit is, um, you know, if the Earth is passing through this threshold, uh, into a new system state in the way that the Anthropocene, you know, scientists suggest, and that's, you know, been su such an interesting provocation for us social scientists and humanities thinkers, then what is it not just to know, to have knowledge about that, you know, um, to gather, um, to measure, you know, CO2 levels and, and, uh, uh, and things like that, or biodiversity loss, or uh, to monitor it, to, to graph it and things like that. Uh, not just to know about it, but somehow to know, what is it to know from within a threshold, from within um, a world that is tipping from one, that is neither in one state nor another. And I think um, this is where I think, well, we both you know, think that we can learn a lot from uh, indigenous peoples, colonized peoples, you know, trafficked, you know, formerly enslaved people, people who have, for whom the world has already ended, for, for whom the apocalypse has already happened, who, but also often for over generations have, have thought about the world as, as much more uncertain and unstable and have learned to kind of um, survive and thrive within it, you know, like the way that, you know, Australian Aboriginal cultures learned to use fire in the open landscape, which is something that Nigel's written more about than, than I have, um, in response to, you know, to millennia of, of uh, environmental change. So I think, I think as well as there being uh, issues of, you know, um, human rights and uh, protecting people and their cultures uh, from these extractive processes. I think, uh, I think you know, without instru further instrumentalizing them and saying, yeah, we will mine your minerals and we also mine your knowledge about how to live through a planetary transition. Um, you know, there are ways we need to really, um, to really value and, uh, and learn from those cultures. And, and this, uh, what Marisol de la Cadena the anthropologist calls earth beings are these sort of um, kind of what we would say is personified natural forces, but they feel as genuine agencies within the land, whether they're mountains or forest beings or whatever. The way these appear 
uh, these sort of moments of danger, particularly, or in these spaces of, you know, of mining and extraction from from uh, non-human nature. I think I think there are sort of clues for the sort of thinking that we need, you know, more generally in globalized, you know, twenty um, first century culture. I think there's sort of wisdom, if you like, for, uh, in in those kind of non secular ways of thinking. You know, we don't have to, you know decide in a scientific sense whether these earth beings exist or not but we can still learn from that way of thinking about how to how to uh, you know what's at stake as as um, environments become unstable uh, and so on thank you brian adam yeah thank you for for bringing up this uh, interesting question and, and this uh, fascinating answer from, from brian too uh this is I mean, this is a big, big topic, as you already said, uh, Bron. And uh, to me, one one way of looking at it is, of course, that this is a, a very good example of, of this general tendency of digitalization to grow bigger and stronger with increasing environmental impact. Only over the last three, four or five years, we see this happening. We already see a, a, an escalating well, uh, at least accelerating the carbon footprint from, from digital technologies, but we also have this, this uh, impact on the crust of, of mining, of, of, of planetary mining, as Martin Arboleda calls it, making a comeback. I mean, it's been been around in Sweden, where I come from, is a mining <laughs> nation since centuries, but over the last decades or so before this, this new digital boom, I mean, people were mostly talking about closing mines. Now they're talking about opening mines. And, and as it happens, not only indigenous people in, in Brazil, but also ind indigenous people in Northern Sweden are now the victims of this process. We just the other week, there were uh, the heads of uh, the European Union uh, visiting because Sweden is now the, the uh, president or leading the, the European Union. Uh, for six months, uh, so visiting these areas where, where there was uh, just it timed a uh, discovery of a huge deposit of rare earth minerals, which a Swedish state company then plans to mine within five to 10 years. And that would be enough to make the whole European Union independent from China, which is now the main uh, producer of these uh, rare earth minerals, which go into to our uh, digital technologies. And this is a, a, a priority for the European Union to become independent, but then it will happen at the cost of these uh, indigenous peoples on whose lands they have herded uh, reindeers for, for centuries, uh, which was, will be completely disrupted. And this, these deposits are in an area where one of the last few areas that has not been mined that, that will now also disappear. Uh, so all of these colonial uh, legacies <laughs> come back again and again. We, in, I think in the post-war, era and the rise of the Western liberal democracies, we learned that this was part of the past. We had decolonized, we had moved on, and now we were all moving towards development and prosperity. But now the Anthropocene teaches us this is not the case. And there's no, there's no uh, digital global infrastructure without a the cost. There's no free lunch here to be had. There's always an impact. And, and as it is today with the, with the economic system we have, the costs are not carried by the companies that profit from it, but from, from people and environments from where it is taken. And that needs to change. Uh, that's on the political level. And then I think it's very inspirational to think about like you were bringing up now, Brown, that other ways of relating to the earth that we can learn from, from indigenous uh, cultures in, in doing this uh, without being extractive in, in, in doing so. But the question is, of course, how do we change the common cosmology? How do we dismantle this machine that feeds on on, on these minerals? Because the, the, that's why I started by bringing up the, the tendency to grow bigger and stronger is, of course, you know, the recent AI boom with large lang language models and so on and bigger and bigger data centers. This is not the necessity it doesn't have to be this way many scholars in this field like um, uh, Shushana Subo or Kit Crawford has pointed to this fact that the, the big tech industry like the companies you brought up like Apple Amazon Google Microsoft and so on have an have an interest in in, in portraying the current development like the mining of rare minerals illegal mining of rare earth minerals in in Amazon as inevitable uh, in saying that if you want to have a, a strong search engine like Google, maybe you have to put up with your data being mined, maybe also some planetary mining 
but that is not the case. There are, there are many other possible ways of doing this. And now we, I would come to think about uh, Sheila Yasanov's concept of socio-technical imaginaries, like how these things are consolidated, how we come to expect a future and accept the future uh, that comes becomes institutionalized uh, through these socio-technical imaginaries. And I think they need to be dismantled. But yeah, I, I'm going to stop there. But thanks for bringing up this question. I think it's an important one. Guys, I've just uh, realized that we are a bit past time. I was completely uh, <laughs> uh, outside of this, this this time regime. So I would like to ask you guys if you have some uh, final remarks so that we can be closing the conversation. If you wanted to bring something up that I, I, I didn't uh, brought up. So, uh, Bron, Adam, how do you feel about that? Um. I mean, I, yeah, I could make a, gosh, I mean, so I have really appreciated the, the request, the opportunity to think about the term geosemiotics and, uh, and I will keep, so thank you, you know, to Andre and Fernando for, for that word in a way. Um, you know, I'm used to sticking geo at the front of everything, you know, geo philosophy, you know, geo this, geo that, um, geo futures, but, you know, geo semiotics is a really, really interesting. And, uh, and I think I, that it will have an after effect on, you know, it, it, hopefully in continuing, you know, exchanges between us three and, uh, four and, um, but also generally in my thinking, you know, uh, and the relationship, you know, so I think that's been really useful, a useful way of framing a bit of what I do and forcing me to think about it in different ways. Um, I just wanted to say something about futures because that came up a lot in the, uh, in the last, um, the conversation. Um, so, for the last few years, I've used, been using the language of futures a bit more in my own work, partly because at Lancaster, the there was the founding by uh, John Urry um, and Linda Woodhead of the Institute for Social Futures, which is a kind of a university level, mainly social science, but very interdisciplinary institute uh, in future studies at Lancaster. Um, so my involvement in that, but also I've been teaching future studies to undergraduates um social scientists for the last few years and have really enjoyed doing that um and i think you know i'm convinced more and more having engaged with the future studies sort of literature and uh, by that with that i include what's called anticipation studies that's a slightly different way of framing that that's come out of uh, people like roberto Polly and um and others uh um is this what the work that's been done particularly uh in the post you know after the second world war in thinking about futures and not just about predicting probable futures you know by predicting forward trends and you know working out what the future is going to be like but thinking in a much broader way through the ideas of utopia but also about lock-in and path dependency and using participatory methods to open up the way people think to, to think more richly and the ideas of foresight, you know, the way that organizations have gone from, you know, trying to do technology forecasting so that they can be ahead of the game or, or and then going through stages of doing scenario planning so that they can be prepared for the uncertainty, uncertain and different possible futures towards a richer kind of foresight model for all the different ways you can think about the future preferable futures, possible futures, and so on. And I, and I think there's something, I'd like to see more of that thing, you know, that, uh, that, that those of us thinking about what the Anthropocene is and what are the futures of our relationship with the earth and, and so on um, are going to be, you know, I think though that scholars working in Anthropocene studies should, should take more advantage, you know, make more of and be more aware, you know, uh, inform themselves much more about that rich, work that's been going on in future studies. So I was thinking about um, like Sahail Inayatullah, his idea of the futures triangle. He talks about the pull of the future, you know, what future do we want, you know, that we try to work towards, but also the push of the present, the way that uh, forces that are already underway, 
what Barbara Adam calls latent futures, you know, trends and things that are already, you know, like CO2 emissions that we can't do anything about are already pushing us and, and colonizing the future from, you know, in a way that we can't control, but also the weight of the past, you know, the way that lo being locked into, you know, market economies and, you know, our transport systems, you know, also have this weight that, that, that constrain the way we, you know, all those those rich ways of thinking, I think, are really, uh, you know, I'd like to see more of that in Anthropocene studies uh, and uh, thinking about, um, yeah, how, how we try to, you know, you know, however limited human agency is in the, in the Anthropocene, you know, how, how we try to, you know, leverage things towards more, more benign futures through thinking more reflexively about the way futures unfold. Adam, you want to jump in, say some final yeah. remarks? Yeah, thank Please. you. Well, th thank you again, Andre, for, for this opportunity and also to, to think about geosemiotics uh, and the Anthropocene in this context and, and the, the fantastic opportunity to be in conversation with, with you, Bron. It's been really, really enriching and, and inspiring. I have a, a lot of takeaways from this and look forward to continuing our discussions in the in the future and i would also would pick up that that future thread and say that i think that or my hope maybe uh, is that in the community of scholars and people engaging with the anthropocene uh, broadly that we are reaching a, a level of maturity now after maybe a decade or a little more of debating and critiquing the very name for that matter we didn't touch upon that which i'm, I'm glad we didn't we can leave it uh, and the the dating and and so on into uh, kind of reckoning with the anthropocene understanding what it means both in in the spatial terms which has been a kind of closure or uh, moving forward with the nature culture debate debate uh, the divide between them and see that okay so we were already always entangled and for instance, that the way we bring this environment, we're changing the environment in different ways and the way we change it affects how we come to think about it. But you can take different approaches to, to understand that spatial aspect. But then there's the temporal one. And then again, we've had now, what is it, 13 years since Dipesh Chakrabarty uh, in his fourth thesis uh, explained that this was the collapse of the dis distinction between human and Arab history. And I think that now is the time to to take up that challenge because again we've been saying that this has happened, but we haven't really changed how we write history. We haven't changed how, how we think about the past and the future and the present. We have had uh, brilliant people like Hans Ulrich Gumbert, for instance, and and Jan Asman and and uh, or Aleda Asman and um, Francois Hartog talking about the crisis of, of time and time is out of joint and the present is broadening. I think to an effect of the Anthropocene or what, the, the condition that we are in. Uh, and, and I think that now is the time to, to, to start to integrate these temporalities and time scales. And then all of a sudden the future might be in the past or we have to think about past and future and present in completely different ways. We have to adjust to the time scales of, of millions and billions of years to the very, very present that we're living now. And, and this is a huge challenge, but I think it, it, that, I, and I hope that, that Anthropocene studies or Anthropocene uh, scholars are now ready to take up this opportunity or this challenge to to move on with it. So, yeah, yeah I thanks. So, uh, thank you very much, guys, for uh, accepting our invitation. We are approaching the uh, the our time limit, but I, I I must say I I enjoyed that we started on the past on the golden spike and then ended on this uh, geo futures and also. The idea of uh, trying to not, not only that the past has some weight as we are experiencing some uh, uh, intellectually, but sometimes also physically uh, on our, our our current day to day lives, and the idea that we must also kind of resist the past in order to open up some futures. I like this idea from Isabel Stanger that the past is not something that is given, but it's also an object of uh, resistance. So on that note, I would like to thank you guys again so much for being here and being uh, so open to create this uh, 
incredible conversation from my perspective and I guess from uh, lots of people and I guess we can uh, keep on maybe do a, a, a second uh, conversation uh, months from now so we can think more on these issues uh, and now we will end the live stream uh, but for the people who uh, started watching us as the conversation was already ongoing uh, this conversation will be recorded in our YouTube on the link that it is right now, so you can access it uh, whatever you like. I will put on the comments to the conversation uh, the uh, the links and the bibliography to both Adam and Bron's work, so you can dive deep deeper on these matters of geosemiotics. Uh, although the word is not uh, used so much, but maybe sometime we will uh, use them. So thank you so much. Uh, Fernando will now uh, kill the live stream. And thank you for everyone that was watching us. And thank you, Bron. Thank you, Adam. Okay, thank you. Thanks for everyone. Thank you.